On behalf of the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Administration for Community Living, and the Indian Health Service, I would like to welcome everyone to the ITU webinar series. My name is Amanda A. Fox, and I work for Kaufman & Associates. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Today's webinar is Meet Your Native American Contact. Please note, this webinar series is supported by a contract awarded by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the Department of Health and Human Services or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We have eight presenters with us today. I would like to introduce you to our lead presenter, Cindy Gillespie. Ms. Gillespie is the Tribal Issues Technical Director for the CMS Tribal Affairs Office and a member of the Medicaid and CHIP Operations Group. Thank you all for joining us today. I will now turn it over to Ms. Gillespie to offer an introduction to today's topic and introduce the rest of our presenters. Hi, good afternoon. This is uh, Cindy Gillespie and I'm very happy to be here today to uh, bring to you our uh, Native American contacts and let each of them tell you a little bit about themselves. So on that note, I'll start uh, with some information about me and then I'll turn it over um, subsequently to each NAC to introduce themselves. Um, as, here's just a photograph of me. Um, I'm Cindy Gillespie. I'm a technical director in the Medicaid and CHIP operations group um, in the division of uh, program operations and that's the division that works with um, the states and the tribes out in the field, and that's where um, some of the NACs are located. Um, to talk a little bit about um, what I do, I'm part of the management team for uh, the group I just talked about. I'm also the team lead for the Native American Contacts, or NACs as we call them. Um, I also uh, work closely with the Division of Tribal Affairs and Kitty Marks is the director of that group and with her staff um, on policy, outreach efforts, education, and other initiatives for American Indians and Alaska Natives. I have 33 years of Medicaid and CHIP experience both in Wyoming for 11 years and at CMS for 22 years. And for the last 20 years at CMS, I've worked with um, tribes and IHS with all the CMS programs. So um, this is these are my coworkers right now. Um, <laughs> I think everyone's working at home. I, I do all the time anyway. But um, so at the top of this is my uh, director of security. That's Lulu. And then there's Oracle and Hannibal, who are my uh, special assistants. And then on the same uh, note, to try to make this a little bit personal so you get to know a little bit about us, I'm a uh, wife. Um, you can see up in the left-hand corner, I have four kids in the middle picture, um, four grandkids, well, five grandkids now, four down in the corner and one brand new one that's uh, two weeks old um, yesterday. Uh, I'm also a mom to a couple of horses, uh, Toby and Maisie. Um, and uh, an avid football fan with the Denver Broncos and with the University of Alabama uh, Crimson Tide. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the Native American contact role. Um, the CMS regional offices created the first Native American contact position in 1998, so it, it predates the Division of Tribal Affairs in CMS. Um, and primarily at that time, we did outreach and education um, on new programs. At the time, there were new provisions for managed care and HCBS, and also the CHIP program was brand new. We did um, consultation sessions on all those programs in 1998 across the country, and those were the first formal CMS consultations. Um, over the years, it expanded to 12 part-time NACs and a technical director by 2019. About a year ago, the CMS, um, well, let me talk 
a little bit about the evolution of the role. So the NAC role expanded over the years from just a point of contact and outreach activities to working with policy guidance on American Indian Alaska Native provisions. In 2009 and 2010, there were a number of um, provisions and special protections for American Indians and Alaska Natives that were enacted by legislation. Um, in the uh, CHIPRA reauthorization and also in the Recovery Act, um, which established a lot of um, policy for American Indians and Alaska Natives in Medicaid and CHIP that had not existed previously. So the role grew into more of a policy-driven role and, and oversight um, with states and and working with regional office and states and tribes to make sure that all the protections um, for American Indians and Alaska Natives were afforded appropriately in the programs. Late last fall, about a year ago, the CMS administrators started looking at and evaluating CMS functions to identify opportunities to better utilize the expertise and experience of the regional office staff. And in November, announced a reorganization that um, we hope improves the integration of regional office staff into policy development and really unifies everyone into one CMS. The CMS NACs were, were um, in Medicaid and CHIP consisted of 10 NACs that worked anywhere from 20 to 80 percent of their time as Native American contacts. With the reorganization, those um, NACs uh, were um, moved into four and a half full-time um, positions, and that was based on the amount of time total that um, was spent previously by the 10 NACs. So, so uh, it's the same amount of full-time attention has just been moved into full-time positions that can really focus on the work um, and be able to specialize in the American Indian Alaska Native subject area, build our expertise to allow for better customer service, and engage um, with tribes on CMS concerns and issues. In addition, um, when we made this transition, we organized the assignment of the NACs into IHS service areas um, instead of by uh, branch, because CMS has been reorganized into four branch. We organized by IHS service areas to better align with the IHS um, and tribal staff and help people to know who to contact for assistance based on the IHS service area they reside in. The NACs kept many of their existing state assignments under the new um, uh, reorganization, so most of them kept their initial assignments and then picked up additional states. And then this next slide is a map of the IHS service areas, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. The following page shows each of the Native American contacts and what they cover um, in terms of IHS service areas. So um, each of them will be introducing themselves later on and, and um, to you, so I won't go through this list, but um, just understand uh, that it's changed to be organized by IHS service area. So <clears throat> the Native American contacts and, and myself, the technical director, will continue to facilitate and participate with DTA in the CMS ITU trainings. We'll continue to work on policy and oversight work and be more focused since um, for most of us it's a full-time assignment now. We'll also assist with the CMS issues as we always have that are raised at HHS consultation meetings each year. And three of our NACs are serving as project officers for the Connecting Kids to Coverage grants that were awarded to tribal and urban programs just a few months ago. So now I'm going to um, 
hand off here to Nancy Grano, who is the NAC for the um, Nashville and Bemidji areas. So, Nancy, take over. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Nancy Grano, and I I work out of the uh, the Boston office uh, of CMS, and uh, uh, I entered federal service in June of 1991, um, and I've uh, worked with CMS since 1995. Uh, I've been the Region 1 Native American contact for more than 10 years, and I've served, I have a couple of uh, grants that I'm project officer for now, and I did, uh, I worked as project officer for three grants a few years ago, uh, the uh, CHIPRA grants. I specialize in Medicaid, and I've worked for years on home and community-based services waivers and long-term services and supports. Uh, I'm the liaison for PASAR and Money Follows the Person, and I was the uh, state lead for Maine for a while um, in the uh, late summer and early fall. So uh, I've been assigned to be the Native American contact for the Nashville and Bemidji areas uh, these um, largely the, the states are kind of new to me. I'm, I'm more familiar with the New England states as far as Medicaid uh, organization. So I'm very happy to help anybody who has questions about uh, CMS programs, and please feel free to call or email me, and uh, I will get you answers or connect you with people who can help you on any of our programs. And thank you very much. I hope everyone is well. Stay safe. Okay, so next up, um, we have our Native American contact, Benetta Harrison. She works with the Nashville areas with the um, states that do not have Indian health service providers or federally recognized tribes in them to work with the American Indian Alaska Native beneficiaries in those states on protections that they may be having trouble accessing or work with the states to implement those. Vanetta also um, assists with organizing resources for the other Native American contacts um, to access. And she also is currently covering for um, one of our NACs who is out on the detail. So Vanetta, um, Carry on. Vanetta, um, we're not hearing you. Are you muted? We're still not hearing Vanetta. Um, try maybe the star six on your phone. Well, um, I'll just go ahead and start. And Vanetta, if you come online, just just let me know. She must be having audio problems. Um, so Venata has, as I pointed out, a number of states that don't have tribes or, or um, Indian health facilities. And they're um, located on this map. Um, so it's pretty much the Nashville area where tribes are not located. For some reason, I'm not, there we go. Arkansas, Tennessee, Missouri, Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Georgia, Washington, D.C., Delaware, New Hampshire, Vermont, New Jersey. Um, as you can see from the map, um, all of those locations, um, actually every state in the Union has American Indians, Alaska Natives there, even when there are not Indian health providers. And so Veneta works with those folks and with the states to make sure that the program is implemented appropriately. And then um, here's uh, a little bit about her role and responsibilities. Veneta provides policy guidance in states with no tribes or tribal health providers, as I said. 
Um, she assists with organizing and facilitating some of the ITU training sessions that we hold each year. She also is building a resource and training library that will be very important for the Native American contacts and other um, division of program operations staff to understand the American Indian and Alaska Native provisions. And she attends the IHS partnership meetings as needed as well. Um, here's a photo of Vanetta. I, I'm not sure what she was. Um, kind of, are you on, Vanetta? I'm on. You're at work. <laughs> okay, we can hear you now. So if you want to talk about this last slide. Okay, I'll do the last slide and then I'll tell you um, a little bit about myself, a little bit more than what Cindy has given. Um, on the last slide was my three children and I on my 70th birthday that, I held, that was held last year. And so along with my three children and my three grandchildren and some of my other family, they helped me celebrate celebrate that milestone. From the beginning, I heard a little bit of what uh, Cindy was saying. Um, she introduced me as the Mac from the East. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I'm a person that I love to travel. I live in New York City. I, I work in New York City. I live in the borough of Brooklyn. Um, in doing my traveling, I've traveled to a few places like the UAE, Abu Dhabi. That first slide was from a desert in Abu Dhabi. I've been to Dubai, Jordan, Cuba, and a few other places, Hawaii and Alaska. I'm a TV producer with the Brooklyn Access TV station. There I write, produce, and host shows. Um, I have worked for the federal government for about 28 years. I started as a GS6 secretary in the Coast Guard. And over the years, I've held positions like personnel specialist, administrative specialist, and a few other things. And last year, whenever um, we reorganized at CMS, um, I was taken from the tribes of the New York Regional Office and given and became the East, the East um, Coordinator or the East NAC. Um, in becoming that, I became the person to oversee the states that don't have federally recognized tribes. There are 13 of those, and I think Cindy showed you a map earlier. They were circled on that map. And um, my, new, my new duties are that I will be setting up a library. I'll be helping with training, um, the CMS ITU training, the consultations as needed, um, furthering partnerships with uh, IHS as needed. Um, I will set up a library, and this is where my, my colleagues come in at. I will need you to send me information if you have it so that um, we can have this information at our fingertips and have it there when we need it. I'm sorry that this is a little blob and, and a little, I got on a little late, but I'm here to help you. I will help you in any way that I can. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Vanetta. Um, You're welcome. Next, we have Dorothy Sadange. Um, if you're ready, Dorothy. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Dorothy Sadange. Since I don't work in the Medicaid division, I wanted to share a little information about the division I do work in. The Dallas Survey and Enforcement Division Survey and Operations Group is responsible for the certification of providers and suppliers for participation in the Medicare program and for the enforcement actions which could lead to a termination of a provider with the, uh, from the Medicare program. 
Most of this is done in connection in conjunction with the state survey agency. And as with most CMS, most of CMS, this division has been responding to the many, many waiver requests in regards to COVID-19. There are three branches within this division. The long-term care branch one is composed of federal surveyors who perform health surveys of mostly nursing homes and sometimes for non-long-term care providers. The federal surveyors also conduct complaint investigations at IHS hospitals in the Dallas region. In the past, some of the federal surveyors have also gone outside the Dallas region to assist other regions with IHS hospital surveys. The long-term care branch two is what I call the nursing home branch. This branch is responsible for all certifications and enforcement actions of nursing homes. This branch also oversees the state agency budget process and monitors all expenditures charged to the Medicare and Medicaid program. The third branch is the acute and continuing care branch and is responsible for the process and certification actions for other facility types than the nursing homes. Most of the enforcement and termination actions, including EMTALAs, are primarily against hospitals, which includes the IHS hospitals. There are eight IHS hospitals in Oklahoma, seven IHS hospitals in New Mexico, three FQHCs in Oklahoma, and two ESRDs in New Mexico. My responsibility in this branch are all the EMTALA reviews for Region 6, which covers a five-state area, death and restraint reporting review, in which all the hospitals are to report any deaths where restraint is used, and serving as a cone for Native American contact. The pictures below, I wanted to go from the youngest to an older generation. The picture on the left is of my great granddaughter, Celia. She lives in Norman, Oklahoma. She's two and a half, and she's showing her spirit for the Oklahoma Sooners. The second picture, or of my grandsons, uh, they live in Mesa, Arizona, and the oldest in the lighter jacket, he, he will be graduating from high school this year. The third picture is of me some time ago when I danced at the Tunica Biloxi Powwow in Marksville, Louisiana. And the last picture on the right is of one of my grandpas. This was taken at the American Indian Exposition, which we call the Indian Fair, in Anadarko, Oklahoma. It was back in the 1960s. And that's about it. And thank you all for participating today. And everybody stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks, Dorsey. And now we'll move to Stacy Schumann. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Or if you're um, on the Pacific side, it's still good morning to you. My name is Stacy Schumann. I'm located in the Dallas Regional Office of CMS. I apologize ahead of time for the barking in my uh, background, but you know, we're all working from home and we do the best we can. I am the Native American contact currently for the UCB IHS areas of the Great Plains. Whoops, can we go back? Can we go back, Cindy? The Great Plains, Oklahoma area and the Albuquerque area. So staying on this slide, a little bit about myself. I've been with CMS since 2005. Like I said, I'm located in the Dallas Regional Office. I'm not a Cowboy fan. I'm not an NFL fan, in fact. My apologies to Cindy Gillespie. I am a basketball fan, so I go to see the Dallas Mavericks play as much as possible. Um, I've been with CMS since 2005, since uh, the week that uh, Katrina hit Louisiana. Prior to that, my background was as a long-term care administrator, Prior to that, I was a full-time homeschooling, business-owning mom and university student. And prior to that, I was a computer programmer in the uh, health insurance and life insurance field. Uh, uh, after joining CMS during my time, the past 14 and a half years, I was involved in the Part D rollout campaign. I worked in the Office of Legislation in the Congressional Affairs Group in our Washington office. When I settled in Medicaid in 2006, since that time, I was the lead on CHIP reauthorization in 2007. I've worked on EPSDT. I've been the lead in oral health and PACE. I was part of the HCBS team, and I got the opportunity to work with each one of our states on their home and community-based service waivers. 
I worked in managed care. And then in 2013, I settled in as a state lead. And since that time in Medicaid, I've worked with the states of Arkansas, New Mexico, and Oklahoma on their Medicaid state plans. I started working in tribal affairs in 2007, and uh, that began as the lead reviewer for Cherokee Elder Care's PACE program. At that time, Jack Allen was the Native American contacting the Division of Medicaid, and he was anticipating retiring, and he invited me to step in in, in his role, and I have enjoyed every minute of it since then in 2007. I've also, along with Dorsey, my colleague, uh, colleague Nat here in Region 6 in the Dallas office, we worked together on the HHS Tribal Health Regional Work Group, and I was also a project officer in the first round of CKC grants back in 2010. So on this slide, you can see, going back to the, the there we go, on this slide, you can see the target for my homeschooling efforts, my daughter Carly, um, who is has made us a Medicaid a family of consumers as she is on the uh, uh, Texas HCDS group home waiver here in the state. And then my son, Dustin, who is one of the U.S. Army's newest military police stations in Fort Campbell and attached to the 101st Airborne. So as you can see in the IHS areas of Albuquerque, Great Plains, and Oklahoma, of course, you know your state, but New Mexico Colorado, North and South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas. My uh, CKC grants are Cherokee Nation, Chickasaw Nation, and Choctaw Nation. And in the years to come, working with Dorsey, I will be either lead or participating in the travel, planning the tra training for Rapid City, Albuquerque, Denver, the Oklahoma area, and Kansas City. Um, so the next slide. Some of my passion, so you'll get to know me. Uh, my daughter Carly and her participation in a, a Special Olympics here in Texas has made us a Special Olympics family. Swimming and basketball are her passions, and we love either going and participating. My son has also been a partner in Special Olympics and has participated in some of their unified sports. I rescue animals, and you will see to the right my current census is three. Uh, Helen, Herschel, and Hubert. Underneath that, my passion is my music, which is a harp, and I've learned that even the worst harp players sound beautiful because it's such a beautiful instrument. I love riding my bike in the fresh air and the sunshine, and in the lower left, you can see where my son surprised his sister with an unannounced homecoming this past year and uh, during the holidays, and we were real happy to experience that. I love international travel. My last trip was to Iceland. Unfortunately, none of those pictures turned out well, so you'll just have to imagine what that looks like. Um, and then next slide. So you can have my contact information as you need it. Why do I have a koala bear on here? Because I've been collecting koala bears since I was 12 when my brother-in-law gave me my first one, and he was trying to get on my good side while he was dating my sister. And since then, I've imagined I've got about 90 in different parts of the house. Um, there's the correct spelling of my name. You can contact me using this phone number, but please know that we're all working from home now. But if you do call and leave me a voicemail, those voicemails come directly to us via email so that we can get back with you. And this is my email address. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions regarding these IHS, IHS areas. Thank you all for being here today. We're so excited that there's so many of you, and we do hope that this has been helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. So next up, we have Mary Munoz. Mary, are you ready? I'm ready. Good afternoon for most, I guess, everyone. My name is Mary Munoz. I work in the Denver office in the Drug Health Plan Operations Office of Program Operations and Local Engagement, um, which is primarily our uh, Medicare managed care plans and prescription drug plan area. Um, <clears throat> I have worked for uh, CMS for about a little over 30 years. 
Um, so I've been saw lots of changes over those 30 years. Um, and I, prior to the reorganization of the NACs, I was a co-NAC, Native American contact here in Denver, um, focusing on Medicare issues with our six states, which includes Colorado, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. Um, and I continue in that role, you know, working with Indian Health Service, tribal clinics, and urban facilities for any Medicare-related issues. Um, and um, I also um, help facilitate any Medicare um, provider enrollment or billing issues with our Medicare contractors. Um, I assist with the annual um, ITU trainings um, in our region, which would include Denver. Well, in the past, Denver, Billings, Rapid City. A few years ago, we had one in Salt Lake City. Um, I'm not sure how that <laughs> will play out with our current situation. Um, I also am the Social Security liaison related to Medicare issues in our region. So I work with Medicare if anyone from the ITUs is having um, issues with Medicare. I help facilitate. Of course, I don't work for Social Security, but um, that relationship in our region is really um, excellent at this point. And then a little personal, I am a mom to five kids. Um, I do have three grandkids who, um, with this isolation, has kept me very busy too. Um, I, I've had to learn a little bit of high school math, and if anyone's had to do that during this time period, you know it's not the same as it was, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. So, um, but that's it about me. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. So next we have um, Cindy LaMesh. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm going to go through this quickly because I want to make sure we have lots of time for questions. So a little bit about me. I've been at CMS since the fall of 2010. I was hired under the Affordable Care Act, um, so almost 10 years. And just some uh, personal information on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm on the left with my uh, smaller friend, and you can see a sliver of the San Francisco Bay in the background because I live just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, I like to travel as well. The middle picture is of me in um, old Montreal last summer. And on the right are my uh, pride and joy, my two grown daughters. Uh, Sarah's on the left. She is um, an opera singer in New York City. And on the right is Rachel, who is studying to be a psychologist in Southern California, virtually. Next slide, please. So my IHS areas are California, Phoenix, Tucson, Navajo, and Portland on a temporary basis because one of my colleagues is um, on a detail. The, um, I have had California, Phoenix, Tucson, Navajo for nine and a half years since I've been here. So um, on the bottom, the only state, the permanent state that is new to me is Utah. So I am still learning that state. And then Idaho, Oregon, and Washington State, I will do my best um, on a temporary basis to answer any questions and help as needed. So um, I think California, is that the first slide? Is there one before? Oh, okay. All right. Arizona. So Arizona has um, 21 recognized tribes. I'm not going to read everything from the state. The takeaway for me for Arizona is um, in terms of best practices, the thing that has impressed me so much about Arizona in the nine and a half years I've been working with um, advocates and the tribal community there is they uh, their advocacy is stellar. They just work really well with the legislature. I've just been really impressed about what they've been able to accomplish, starting with the Great Recession. And I think part of that is um, American Indians and Alaska Natives are a relatively large part of the Medicaid population. 
Um, but just uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Arizona, I, uh, they're just very strong in um, getting things done for the tribes and the tribal community, and I am proud to say I'm the technical advisor to the Arizona Advisory Council on Indian Health Care, which has been a wonderful experience. Next slide, please. For the Navajo Nation, I think that the Navajo Nation, um, I put a picture, a photograph that was taken uh, when I was fortunate to go to the Navajo Nation for tribal consultation years ago. The Navajo Nation is the largest reservation in the United States. It spans three states. And I put that uh, there, a picture of children, because right now the Navajo Nation is really afflicted by COVID-19, and um, children give us hope. Next slide, please. Nevada. Um, Nevada is a small state. It has no just primary care clinics. There's an, a, a youth regional uh, residential treatment center there and some urban facilities. And um, we uh, recently approved a tribal FQHC spa. I think that they work relatively well, the tribal community, with the state because of uh, small. Uh, next slide, please. Utah, I'm just learning, um, eight federally recognized tribes. They just have primary care, and uh, I'm learning about the tribe um, right now and the issues that they have. I'm not sure if California was in there. California, next slide, please. Let's see if it's there. Okay, I'll just say quickly about California. Uh, what I will say about California, which I think says it all, is it is the largest Medi-Cal Medicaid program in the United States at 13 million people, one in three Californians before COVID-19 had Medi-Cal. The number of American Indians and Alaska Natives is about 60,000, and that says it all. So um, I have to perform a lot of advocacy. The tribe struggle to get heard here, and I am here to help if you're from California. Um, I will work as hard as I can to make sure that your issues are raised and addressed. And that's all. Moving along. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so this, uh, our Native American contact that wasn't able to attend today wasn't able to attend because she's an everyday hero right now. She's working um, at a clinic on the COVID-19 um, efforts. She's a member of the Commission Corps and a nurse. Um, Rhonda um, is a member of the Spokane tribe. She's a wife, a mother, and grandmother. She's worked in the medical field for 30 years um, and worked in policy for the last 15. She's, she wanted me to let you know that she is um, passionate about her work with the communities and she's compassionate with the people she's serving and willing to assist when and wherever she can. Um, after 30 years of work in, in this field with Indian Health, and, and um, she worked with Indian Health Service and other tribes um, promoting health and wellness in the communities, um, that she still feels good about it and still learns every day um, new things and, and still um, is passionate about that work. So I wanted to give you a little bit of information that she shared with me. Um, and then um, Rhonda is located in Seattle, but she serves six states. Um, she serves the Alaska IHS area, so that's just the state of Alaska. She serves the uh, Portland area, which is Idaho, um, Oregon, and Washington, and she serves the Billings area, which is Montana and Wyoming. So these are the states she serves. I'm not gonna go through the demographics because um, those of you who are in the states already already know um, your information. So I'm going to um, wrap it up there. Rhonda, um, her contact information is in the, um, located on the web. She should be back in 30 days. Um, and you can always send questions along with um, uh, to each individual NAC to the uh, mailbox at tribalaffairs at cms.hhs.gov. And so now I think we're ready for any questions if we have any. Um, so it looks like, I guess, um, were you gonna facilitate the questions, Kaufman or? 
Yes, I'll go ahead and take over from here. Um, we will now move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Please enter your questions in the Q&A pod located at the bottom right side of your screen. Our first question is directed towards Nancy. When we are able to travel, could we expect you to visit our tribal programs in the BEM area? Well, hi. Uh, it's uh, that's a. Of course, I would I would love to visit um, some of the in in the early days when I was working with uh, HCBS waivers. Um, one of my favorite things was to go and spend three or four days in a state on uh, visiting people who were participants in the waiver programs and also with the, the state staff and, and social workers. Um, I don't think there's any uh, substitute for visiting and, and talking to people and seeing exactly what uh, the pro programs are so I can really understand them. Uh, it Years ago, there was no problem with funding. Um, lately, there, there really, it's, it's, a, it's a whole different story. There's not funding for travel generally. So uh, I only say that because I would be very happy to, uh, to visit all of you. Um, it depends on funding with CMS with, uh, for our programs. Um, that said, uh, anybody uh, is welcome to get in touch with me, and uh, I, I substitute for traveling with uh, uh, speaking to people, and, and I'm perfectly willing to uh, to visit with you on the phone for as long as, as is, is needed to understand any of the issues that you have to raise. So I'm very happy to meet everybody, and I'll put aside some time to try to do that uh, over the next few months. So thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Nancy. Our next question is directed to Dorsey or Stacy. Due to the Medicaid expansion starting July 1st, about half of the Oklahoma tribal members may need a change from marketplace insurance to Medicaid. Who can we contact for more guidance on this matter? Hi, thank you. This is Stacy Schumann. That's a good question. And since it's Medicaid oriented, I think I'll probably go ahead and answer for both Dorsey and myself. Um, Oklahoma has what they refer to as a no wrong door um, policy for enrolling in Medicaid. In other words, there's no wrong way to do that. So you can call the 800 number. You can contact them via email. You can contact me, forward your information to me, and I'll make sure that a caseworker gets your uh, email. We ask, though, that if you do that, you do not include any personal identifying information, a simple phone number, a simple name and phone number, the correct spelling of your name is fine. And we let them uh, get all of your personal identifying information, uh, your eligibility criteria from you directly. The, that does not need to be sent to CMS. You can go online, you can call them, you can email them, uh, which pretty much sums up the no wrong door. That's how you would enroll. Also, there should be, if you have a relationship with a provider, if you are a regular at any clinic, their benefits coordinator to their frontline people should also be able to facilitate your enrollment into the program. Um, but please feel free, first of all, to contact me and let me know, and I'll make sure that you get with the correct person. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Our next question is directed to any of our presenters. How can charitable clinics without CMS contacts form a permanent alliance so we can better serve our Native American communities? This is Cindy Gillespie. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, if, if you're looking for um, someone to assist with CMS programs, I would still go ahead and contact the Native American contact for whatever state you reside in. Um, there's a contact list out on the uh, CMS um, American Indian Alaska Native pages. And if, um, I don't know if Kitty's on, I don't have the address for that, but if you search uh, for the Division of Tribal Affairs or American Indian Alaska Natives in, at CMS, you should be able to get that page um, to come up with the contact list. Um, and perhaps 
can share it out after the call. Right, and this is Kitty. You can go to cms.gov forward slash AIAN and make sure AIAN are capitalized. And uh, then the Native American contact should be at the bottom of that first outreach page that you reach. And maybe uh, who's controlling the slides, we could go back up to all the lists of the NACs and the states that they're Yeah, it'll take covered. a while to get back through them. I was trying okay. to do that. Okay. <laughs> they're animated, so it takes a while. I'll get it up on the screen. Okay. Thanks, ladies. I will go ahead and go into the next question. Uh, Cindy, when will Oregon get a permanent representative? So this is Cindy Gillespie, and Rhonda is the permanent representative. She's just out for 30 days. So she'll be back um, in 30 days, and, and um, you'll be able to contact her. In the meantime, Cindy LaMesh can um, take care of any uh, questions you have. Thank you. Uh, another question directed towards Cindy. How can we contact you? Um, Cindy Lamash, is that a question for Cindy Lamash or Cindy Gillespie? I believe it's directed to Cindy Gillespie. So if you go to that NAC list that Kitty just gave you the address for, my uh, contact information is there. Um, it's uh, Cynthia.Gillespie at cms.hhs.gov, but um, I'm on that Native American contact list at the bottom. Thank you, Cindy. This next question is directed towards Cindy Lamesh. How can we find more information about the Washington State Services? Uh, you can contact me at Cynthia, C-Y-N-T-H-I-A dot Lamesh, L-E-M-E-S-H at C-M-S dot H-H-S dot gov, and I will help. Uh, I will have to do some research myself, but I'm happy to do that. So send me an email, and I will respond. Thanks, Cindy. This question is also directed towards you. How many federally recognized tribes are located in Nevada? The slide stated there are only 19, but we have been working with a list of 27 federally recognized tribes. Lamash, we, we can't hear you as you're talking. Oh, sorry, sorry. There, you know, there are inconsistent counts online, so um, I think it is higher than lower, but the place where I went to said uh, 19, but I do think it's in the 20, so I apologize for any um, omissions or inaccuracies on my part. Thank you, Cindy. Our next question is directed towards Nancy. Will there be an opportunity to do a online meeting with you individually or collectively? Hi. Um, you know, that's, yeah, sure, why not? Um, and uh, by individually or collectively, um, I'm happy to, actually, I should say, if, if there's anyone, uh, especially in, in the Bemidji area, if, there's, if there are any uh, calls, like standing calls, that anyone has that they would like me to be, to join in in case there are questions for CMS, um, if you send me information on that, I'm happy to register for anything. Um, but specific to the question, um, if anybody would like to email me, um, it, it helps if you have a, a subject that you may want to talk about, but just on a, a, for a general uh, meet and greet or what, whatever you would like. If you would email me, uh, we can set up WebEx calls that, um, with a call-in number. I'm happy to do that, and uh, I'm happy to meet with anybody that wants to email me. That actually makes my life easier because I believe there are 68 tribes in the in the uh, territory that I'm going to be covering. So um, I'm happy to meet with everybody, anybody, individually, collectively. Um, but it, it would be great if you could uh, email me and let me know, and I can set up something. Uh, we do have we have a couple of different platforms that we can use to schedule calls, uh, WebEx calls seem to work pretty well. Um, but uh, let me know, and uh, I'll, I'll be in touch. Uh, email works very well for me. Uh, I do check my, my phone uh, calls 
in Boston because I am working from my home. But uh, uh, if you email me, that'd be great. I'm happy to meet with with anybody and talk and talk with you. I, I like I'm kind of kind of lonely to talk to. I like to talk to people, so uh, I look forward to hearing from from everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nancy. Our next question is directed to any of our presenters. Will we receive a certificate of attendance for attending all of the ITU webinars? Kitty, do you, I think that, um, I'm not sure if there's one for these six webinars. Kitty, is there? Right, this is Kitty Marks. There are no CEUs for these six webinars, but we do plan to hold the ITU trainings um, that are usually face-to-face, -face, but we've had to uh, cancel many of those. We'll be starting to hold the um, ITU trainings virtually over about a two-week period where we'll, we will be offering up to 14 different webinar slots, and uh, those webinars will reflect what we would have provided in a face-to-face -face training, and there will be CEUs uh, for those trainings, uh, you know, our registration information will be going up shortly. So you'll need to register for that particular training um, in, in your particular area in order to receive those CEUs. So we'll get more information out on that. So. Thank you, ladies. Um, I, the next question is directed towards anyone. Do you know if there is tracking for the billing for encounter rate for the telehealth services provided by Medicare patients? I don't know, Kitty. Do you know? I'm sorry. What was the? What, I didn't hear the beginning. Is there? Is there tracking for billing for the encounter rate for telehealth services by Medicare patients? I I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, it, there is uh, Medicare has waived a lot of its regulations and is expanding the availability of services covered through telehealth, has expanded the types of providers that can provide telehealth. And, Bill, there's um, many, many questions that CMS has issued regarding telehealth, and those can be found on CMS and that will take you to uh, additional resources uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and Novitas had, Novitas, the Medicare contractor for IHS, had an excellent webinar um, yesterday. Um, so there is a lot of information, a lot of availability for Medicare telehealth billing. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, ladies. The next question is directed towards Stacy. With the CARES Act and waivers in place, does the four-wall rule apply for telehealth under MDC and MCR? So this Excuse is me, MCD. I'm going to I'm going to take that. Thanks. Um, so for Medicaid, um, we went out with FAQs in 2017 um, about the four walls issue. Um, indicating that we would not be doing enforcement activities for the fault for walls rules for clinic until 2021. Um, so if, if people are doing telehealth um, in the clinics, it should be okay for Medicaid. Um, Kitty, do you want to take the Medicare question? Um, yeah, and for Medicare, um, as part of the waiver of regulations, they do allow um, a provider who is not in the facility or the clinic, um, they, the provider can be at home, the patient can be at home under Medicare, um, that facility can bill for those services using the point of service of the facility. Um, and, and can bill for Medicare services provided outside of the facility walls. And as Cindy said, that's true for Medicaid um, because we are not enforcing the four walls limitation during this time or until January 2021, actually. Thanks. Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, our next question is additional funding available with IHS for a lot American Indian and Alaska Natives who need treatment for COVID related illness if purchase and referred care is the only option. That's probably funding that would have gone to IHS and I'm not sure I know exactly what they've gotten for COVID. Do you know, Kitty? Um, yeah, they've they've received a con considerable amount of money. I can't uh, remember the exact amount, but I, I would just say that, um, you know, now because of the CARES Act, um, COVID testing is covered um, under Medicaid and it's covered under Medicare. And so I think what a lot of tribal communities are thinking about is um, this is a time when American Indians, Alaska Natives, if they're not enrolled in Medicaid, they're not enrolled in Medicare, um, they should should try to, to try to enroll during this time because there's opportunity to uh, perhaps access services that might not be as readily available at an IHS or, or tribal facility. Thank you. Our next question is directed towards Cindy G. Wyoming has an ongoing issue with a hospital that is not honoring PRC rules and tribal self-funded coordination. Who can we contact about this? So um, you can contact, um, I think first, first you should contact your IHS area office in Billings um, and have them review the situation and make sure that they agree um, that it is a violation. And then if they do, you can contact Benetta, um, Harrison, or myself, and, and we can work with our um, counterparts that enforce conditions of participation if they're in violation. Thank you, Cindy. Our next question is directed towards Nancy. How can we contact you directly by phone or email? You can uh, the the list of our contact information um, is where we we had described before. But my my email is nancy dot grano g r a n o at c m s dot h h s dot g o v, and uh, the phone number, if you'd like that, is six one seven five six five one six nine five. And I'm not in the office, but I will pick up a uh, phone. Calls, but email kind of works better. But uh, so I hope that helps. Thank you, Nancy. Our next question is directed towards Dorsey or Stacy. Who is the Missouri NAC? Okay, that would be Vanetta um, Harrison, and I'll let her weigh in on that. Yeah, so if you have a question in Missouri, you can contact Renetta Harrison. Okay, thank you. Our next question is directed towards Nancy. The Wisconsin unemployment and the additional 600 federal stimulus put some possible members over the income threshold. How is this to assist the PCR, PRC funding for the COVID-19 CARES Act? Are you all talking about the Medicaid threshold? Sorry, that's not clear. I'm going to assume you're talking about Medicaid, and I'm going to say that um, the Medicaid programs in the states um, are not terminating people when they get over income right now due to um, some provisions that require them to keep people enrolled. Um, uh, during this time, during the COVID um, public health service uh, emergency. So they shouldn't get, um, they shouldn't lose their Medicaid if that's the question. I'm um, not sure about SSI or something. Well, Cindy, that, um, and I, I just, this is Nancy. Um, I'd like to add to that. Uh, I think there are some relatively new uh, Q&As that are posted on CMS website. Uh, there's been a lot of work on the eligibility uh, eligibility specialists having to do with that. Um, 
if I if I, I don't know if I understand the question correctly, uh, I don't believe that the those payments are counted for purposes of, of um, eligibility, and some some of the payments aren't even covered for any even for post eligibility. Right. So uh, so I think um, there there are uh, there are Q Q and A's out. Maybe what CMS should do is. Well, what I'll do is I'll I'll send out some of those Q and A's and some links. Um, it's it's all sort of easy to find in one particular place on the CMS website. But uh, but just to add to what Cindy said, I don't believe those those payments um, count. So that that wouldn't that wouldn't affect uh, the eligibility uh, for your for your members. Thank you. Our next question is directed towards anyone. If we service patients covered by two NACs, for example, Oklahoma or Missouri, do we need to work with both NACs? So probably it depends on what you're working with. Um, and I say that because, you know, Medicaid in Oklahoma is very different from Medicaid in Missouri, and so you probably would need to work with each different NAC. If it's something like a Medicare question that is more uh, uniform across the nation, probably one NAC or the other could answer your question. So I think it, the answer is it depends. Sorry. That's probably the best I could give you there. Thank you. Um, we will now take a few or Probably two questions from the phone through our operator. Ming, can you please give instructions for asking a question over the phone? As a reminder to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Again, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. There are no questions at this time. Presenters, you may continue. Thank you. Um, we are going to go ahead and wrap up today's webinar. Any questions that were not covered will be sent out via email um, to our presenters to ask later. Um, thank you for joining today's hey. webinar. Our set Amanda, I'm sorry. This is Kitty. I just want to remind everybody that we will have a webinar on April 30th. Um, and that webinar uh, will be on Medicare 101, and the speaker will be Mary Munoz. And you can find um, information on how to register for that webinar, again, by going to go.cms.gov forward slash A-I-A-N, and that should be capitalized, and go to the spotlight page, and then you can see um, the additional webinars that will be held all the way through June 25th, and you can go ahead and register for those um, now or when it gets closer to the date. So thank you. Thank you. Again, I would like to thank you all for joining today's webinar. Our session is now concluded. Have a great rest of your day.